2022 program of the Indiana German Heritage Society. I uh, welcome you all and thank you all for, for joining in. Um, we, of course, intended to be for aught in, in the actual place that we're talking going to talk about tonight down in Batesville, Oldenburg. But we're going to hope that we are able to do that next year where we can continue um, discussing the topics that we're going to bring up tonight. Now, this evening's program involves a presentation by our own beloved Bill Selm, and then a um, discussion response to the to the presentation by our panel, which consists of Dr. Don Heinrich Holzmann from Cincinnati and our own Indiana German Heritage Society architectural historians, Ron and Don Flick. And then we have some questions uh, that I will pose as moderator because moderators get to do that. And then we will have via the chat, questions from the audience. That's all you. So if you have any questions for Bill or our panel, um, around eight o'clock, I suppose we'll be getting to that point. Uh, then you bring uh, type that into the chat and I'll bring them up and we'll have responses from our panels and our present presenter. So proceeding to the presentation, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the one, the only, Bill Selm, William Selm, architectural historian, public historian, um, teacher, teaches uh, those subjects at IUPUI, um, author, published a number of works, particularly uh, poignant to us at the moment is the Dick Weiser through Indianapolis. Um, civic, civic action, uh, the deep scholarly uh, presentation, uh, application for the uh, Athenaeum building to be put on the uh, National uh, Register of Historic Places, and so on. So I could go on, but only one more very significant thing from the standpoint of the Indiana German Heritage Society is that Bill was Hoosier German of the Year in 2019, an honor that he richly deserved and continues to deserve. So, Bill, with no further ado, bitte, well, I'll turn it over to you. And thank uh, you also for doing this. Oh, yeah, you're welcome, Giles. Um, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm what I'm going to present is something I presented in uh, in 1982 in March of 1982. So I've trained. I've uh, thanks to Dee Dee Davis turned this into a PowerPoint. Plus, I have an update <clears throat> as, as well. So I want to I want to present to you what I presented to the Society of Architectural Historians in Boston in 1982. <clears throat> so um, I guess I ought, to get, I ought to get to that. <clears throat> this. So as I said, it was first presented uh, 13th of March. So um, um, what is that, 40 years? I'm not too good with math, but uh, looks like 40 years ago. <clears throat> and it was very memorable as well. So what I want to do is, is all right. So uh, what I want to do is, is to walk you through <clears throat> how I observed and recorded and interpreted Oldenburg from the point of view of historic preservation. So my paper that I wrote for <clears throat> in graduate school is a guide to historic preservation. And uh, so let me let me walk you through this. Most of my images, except when we get to the the uh, the postscriptum, are going to be pictures that I took in 19, uh, 1980, 1981. And by the way, I spent two weeks 
my wife and I spent two weeks of our honeymoon right after we got married recording Oldenburg because I worked on the National Register nomination in Boston, Massachusetts. So Oldenburg is listed in the National Register. <clears throat> Okay, um, so uh, I wrote the paper actually for the, for the people of Oldenburg in mind to, to better know and understand their architecture <clears throat> as an important part of their ethnic heritage. The paper also identifies building conservation and design problems and addresses way, ways to remedy them. Of course, looking at Oldenburg, if you look at the image there, the, 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 actually you can see the skyline <clears throat> from a distance, those very famous spires, Oldenburg. And I don't know where that term uh, came from, the village of spires, but it's a, it's a perfect nickname for Oldenburg. <clears throat> Oldenburg is a, has a population of about a thousand people. It's located in Franklin County, as you can see highlighted on the map. <clears throat> this is an 1882 map, as you can see, of Franklin County. Uh, Ray Township is highlighted in yellow, and then Oldenburg from that same map is 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 here on the screen <clears throat> and we can see and if you look at some of the property owned names of property, it's all solidly german uh sisters of saint francis was a german order and uh, to the here to the south you can see ing that's the garing farm which also was the brickyard And of course, the, the uh, landscape <clears throat> in Franklin County, especially Southern Franklin County, uh, is rolling. So you have some deep, uh, dense, dense forested areas, rolling creeks, and for the most part, we have some uh, ridge tops, which are in bottomland, which is very, very productive. And this is Oldenburg as it looked in 1892 from that, from that atlas. <clears throat> it was a small town surrounded by rolling farmland and patches of dense woodland. Oldenburg was founded in, in 1837 by two German land speculators <clears throat> and their names are here, uh, Ronnebaum, uh, J. Henry Ronnebaum and Henry Plaspol. Both of them came from Oldenburg, Germany, not the city, but the Grand Duchy. And their, they and their parents had only recently become Oldenburgers because Napoleon smashed the map of the, really the medieval map of, of Germany, the Holy Roman Empire, <clears throat> and gave this Catholic pocket uh, to, the, to the Protestant uh, Grand Duke of Oldenburg. So the Oldenburgers that came from, that, that came here were from the Catholic pocket. So atypically, they were not Protestant, but Catholic, but that was just because of Napoleon's uh, map alt alteration schemes. <clears throat> so, and of course, Oldenburg, the Grand Duchy was located in Northern Germany. And so the plan here, the advertisement, I don't know the source of that. This came from the uh, 1937 uh, centennial history. I speculate that it came from the Wahrheit, the Wahrheitsfreund, which is the, the, uh, the friend of truth, which was a Catholic, German Catholic newspaper from Cincinnati, probably the source. And if you look at this uh, quickly, you can see recent, the town has recently been created and it is uh, essentially between Cincinnati and, uh, and Indianapolis. There is a projected railroad and then the projected Whitewater Canal, <clears throat> which, was, which was built through Franklin County. And the railroad came later and it went through not Oldenburg, but of course, Batesville. <clears throat> of course, that's what made Batesville then uh, a larger and uh, industrial city uh, that it is today. And, uh, so what we, what we have, of course, is this wonderful collect, architectural collection. It's a treasure chest. It really is. Uh, of course, Village of Spires, and there are the spires for us to enjoy. <clears throat> now, the, those two men who bought the land, uh, the Ronbaum and Plaspolar, they were invited by the first pastor there in Oldenburg, whose name was Father Fernading. And Fernading was this he was a, an indefatigable 
missionary, find, founding uh, German Catholic parishes throughout southeastern Indiana. He would find a collection of, of, of German farmers who would found a uh, parish, and then, then typically <clears throat> a town would grow or a village would grow up around the church. But in the case of Oldenburg, he wanted a definite town, a definite center. And uh, that's what he did because he was also an Oldenburger. He knew Plaus uh, uh, Poller and Ronnebaum <clears throat> and invited them because they had the capital. So what I, what I see is that we, uh, Ronnebaum and Plaus Poller are seen as the founders, but really a co-founder, the third member, is a Father Joseph Fernanding because it was his idea. He had the vision, they had the money. And uh, so Oldenburg was laid out and then the uh, lots were sold. And of course the first parish church was the church of St. Mary's made of log. <clears throat> and then we have a, a few years later, we have a very visionary and dynamic priest to serve these North Germans, but he is from Elsass. In uh, on the on the Rhine, in, which would be in southern Germany. Actually, it's in France, but uh, he's German speaking. And so, what uh, uh, Father Franz Josef Rudolph does is he sees the miserable conditions of this log rectory and the log church, and he has big plans. He is a, he was a great visionary. <clears throat> so there are there are there's the the founders of Oldenburg. And then there's the founder of founder of Oldenburg as the village of Spires. And Father Franz Josef Rudolph is the founder of Oldenburg as the village of Spires. It's his vision. <clears throat> and so what, what he does in the 1840s, right after he gets here, his plan is to build a permanent a stone church. And that, that building is still standing and we'll see pictures of it later. <clears throat> he has a vision. And the vision is to serve his people. His vision is to serve his people. His people are German-speaking Catholics uh, in this, not only in Franklin County, but in the surrounding counties, because those parishes that Father Fernanding uh, founded are then uh, served by him on horseback. These priests lived, lived in the saddle. They were constantly serving their flock. And also, uh, Father Franz Josef Rudolph was responsible for founding other parishes. <clears throat> He's also responsible for inviting the first sister to arrive. So he's considered the co-founder, uh, along with <clears throat> Mother Teresa Hockelmeyer. And this is a portrait of her, which was painted uh, posthumously. And uh, what results then is this magnificent uh, uh, campus, this magnificent collection of great buildings, which of course add to the, uh, the spire uh, skyline. So again, building, 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 and building figuratively as well as literally. <clears throat> and of course the sisters then serve uh, Catholic schools, German as non-German as well. Uh, in Indianapolis, St. Louis, Cincinnati, throughout southeastern Indiana and beyond. And then in the 1960s, they were engaged in missionary work in New Guinea. But she came from Vienna. She came from Vienna all by herself. So we have this Austrian connection. <clears throat> and the other one is Father Fernanding and Father Rudolph were inspired by publications published by the Leopoldinsverein in Vienna and the Marienverein in Munich, which were organizations to support missionary work in the new world. And uh, specifically, they, that inspired them. So we have this connection also to Vienna and the charitable works of the, of the Habsburg family. So by the 1860s, <clears throat> 1860s, um, Father Franz Josef Rudolph had plans to build a bigger and newer church made of brick. And Oldenburg became a collecting point for, for, uh, for people then moving into southeastern Indiana. And, and many of them were moving from Cincinnati or other ports on the Ohio, because Cincinnati became the great German city on the Ohio River. 
Oldenburg owes its character and its skyline uh, of spires to Father Franz Josef Rudolph. This Alsatian priest was a spiritual leader, but also a civic leader. He was he provided the, these wonderful leadership skills <clears throat> to make this a reality, to really creating what Oldenburg is. And uh, as I said, he built the stone church, and he himself helped help bring the stones up from the creek bed, the limestone, to, to build it. So he was definitely hands-on. He wasn't sitting back telling people what to do. He did it. He led by doing. <clears throat> and under Father uh, Rudolph's leadership, the, the, Holy Fam the new Holy Family Church was constructed, and the Franciscan Monastery was established. Now, Father Franz Josef Rudolph died in 1866 from injuries sustained from being thrown by his horse. As I said, he and other uh, missionary priests lived in the saddle. So he died from his injuries, but before he died, he made arrangements that he would be succeeded by the Franciscan friars and priests, originally from the Tyrol in Austria, uh, who, who were then from the St. John the Baptist uh, uh, province in Cincinnati. So this became, this became a supercharged Franciscan educational center with the friars as well as the sisters. <clears throat> and then the sisters were dedicated to education, the friars were as well. Now, throughout the 19th century and the early 20th century, the little town continued to grow and it attracted many skilled artisans. So here's a view of 1887. So we can see the Holy Family uh, Church before the spire was enlarged. It's now much taller. <clears throat> and then we can see the convent buildings, which, which predate the ones that are there now, the large chapel, as well as the convent and academy building. And there we find Father Rudolph's onion-domed stone church, uh, finished in 1848. But you can also see all these houses uh, lining the streets. This is Water Street, <clears throat> and then uh, businesses lining uh, um, uh, Hauptstrasse or Main Street and filling up the town. And we have businesses, we have industry. So we have a number of manufacturers, skilled craftsmen, attracted many skilled artisans, craftsmen, and merchants. <clears throat> And we see here a uh, owner and employees of the St. Joseph Woolen Mill. Now here's the owner, but the man on the end here with the measuring tape around his neck, he is the tailor. That turns out to be my great-great-grandfather, Franz Joseph Holker. And Holker came here <clears throat> from Cincinnati by way of Lafayette, because there was, saw an ad for a tailor needed at the Woolen Mill. So the Woolen Mill building is still standing. It has been functioning as the Oldenburg garage. <clears throat> so the typical 19th century Oldenburger was German, Catholic, skilled, hardworking, prosperous, and property owning. Uh, so those houses were built by uh, the people who lived in them. Among the local industries of the craftsmen of the period, of course, is the uh, Woolen Mill, also a brickyard, a brewery, <clears throat> wagon makers, wainwrights, blacksmiths, lumber yards, uh, furniture factories, masons, and uh, any number of, of crafts. For instance, these iron gates have been repurposed. <clears throat> I don't know if they are of local origin or were, or were, or were sent out. This, this originally was at the convent, one of the convent gates, and as I said, has been repurposed into a little garden. <clears throat> and they had two types of shoemakers, leather shoes and wooden shoes. Ben Damus um, was a wooden shoemaker, and my grandfather knew him and knew that Mr. Damus was getting on in years, and this was a, pass, uh, a, a, a part of the passing culture. So he commissioned uh, Damus to make two pair of shoes for his two little girls, and one of those little girls, of course, is my, my uh, mother. And these are sh wooden shoes. Uh, cut, carved in the in the Oldenburg style. And note that you know if you see wooden shoes, it's usually the ones from the Netherlands. These are distinctively different. <clears throat> and uh, my great great grandfather, uh, I don't know if he owned this building, but he used it. 
he had the tavern on this side and this door went into his tailor shop after he left the woolen mill. <clears throat> and of course that building is still standing. It's one of the many, uh, many commercial buildings that were constructed and also enhanced. All this decorative work here is stamped sheet metal. It's not stone or wood <clears throat> or terracotta. It is stamped sheet metal. And other commercial buildings. It's also typical <clears throat> of these merchants to live above their building. That means they can A, keep an eye on things, and B, you only have one roof to, to pay for. One building, one roof, and you are close to your business. <clears throat> this picture shows, a group picture shows uh, activities, and this one, this also came from the uh, Centennial History. What I, there are the two friars, the teachers of the school. It's also a lay teacher. And note that the boys in the front are wearing those wooden shoes. So wooden shoes then were typical, of course, before the advent of rubber boots, because they were waterproof. Well, you know, as long as the water is not too high. The picture below also is from the centennial history. It shows two groups, the musicians of the old Eclipse band, and also the Shisa Company. The Shisa Company is a gun club, but it is a gun club for a specific purpose because they are the honor guard uh, during the, cor the annual Corpus Christi procession. <clears throat> and uh, they fire the volleys instead of ringing bells uh, for the Blessed Sacrament. <clears throat> and as time goes on in 1937, the, that eclipse band has been replaced by the cheer makers and with that wonderful um, drum head. And also note that there are, uh, the sidewalks are paved with, with also brick. I mentioned the Corpus Christi procession in German, the, uh, the Fronleichnam procession. There it is in all of its glory. And it was still that wonder, wonderful, monumental, splendid, uh, religious procession expressing devotion to, uh, to uh, the body of Christ in the Blessed Sacrament with four uh, stops, uh, four uh, station altars, and the last one being the one in, in front of the town hall. And that is part of this Catholic, German Catholic uh, uh, tradition brought over and then, of course, uh, in the case of the religious activities, uh, uh, supported and encouraged by the, by the clerics. So we had uh, furniture factories, we had masons, we had uh, 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 church decorators, <clears throat> tailors, butchers, tinsmiths, uh, cooper shop, uh, shoe and harness makers, and also 14, at one point, 14 different taverns, <clears throat> 14 different ones. Of course, my grandfather's joke was that was the 14 stations that you could, you could uh, make. Uh, so typical of these, they, what they wanted to do and they did successfully is to, in this, in this fully German community, <clears throat> they transplant their old world culture, starting schools, taught by the friars and, uh, and the sisters in, in German language, organizing bands, choirs, gun clubs, and continuing many religious traditions, uh, as I said, including the Fronleichnam. And that, that tradition goes back to the Middle Ages. It was especially popular uh, in German areas, but then it became universal within the Catholic Church. Feast of Corpus Christi. And it was... It was, of course, solidly German. And the language on the street was German. The language in the schools was German. The language in church was Latin and German. <clears throat> and in the homes, it was German. Typical of the German enclaves, they transported their culture and supported it and reinforced it. <clears throat> reinforced, of course, by, uh, by the institutions of the church. Of course, I said the sisters the founding sister was from Vienna, and the priests, the uh, friars, were from the Tyrol originally. But as time goes on, uh, following two world wars with its uh, vicious anti German propaganda, uh, which leads to uh, really the almost the annihilation, uh, extermination of the German language, 
<clears throat> not just in Indiana, but but throughout the country. Oldenburgers sometimes lost interest in the, some of these traditional institutions. Uh, of course, the lang when the language goes, so, so go other uh, traditions which are rooted in the language. And of course, they became more assimilated with the help of radio, automobile, and television. But really, the splendid survivors of this vanishing German Catholic culture is the historical architecture of Oldenburg. Now, Oldenburg is, is significant for its architecture, which helps to tell the story of Western settlement, immigration, building traditions, and religion in America. The buildings were well built to serve the immigrants and their descendants. They weren't just built, they were well built to serve multi-generations, which they do. They range from the great, the the great religious structures, which of course have those spires, which, which uh, uh, point upward from the skyline to not so humble corn cribs. So this corn crib, that lattice work is all made of brick. Of course, this is well ventilate the corn, which is be on this side as well as the other. <clears throat> and this was, is still standing on the Gehring farm. The Gehring farm also had the brickyard. So we have a wide range of, of architectural expressions. Of course, it's the spires that dominate with those Catholic uh, religious traditions. Together, they make up the architectural unit that is Oldenburg with examples of religious buildings, domestic buildings, <clears throat> commercial buildings, uh, mostly most of them on Main Street, but not all. <clears throat> and the lone public building, which is the city hall, the Rathaus, uh, which also is the home of the Eagle Fire Company. Industrial buildings, uh, we had small workshops, but also the sisters, the sisters were self-sufficient. They had farmland, they had orchards, they also generated their own electrical power. And until recently, it was on DC direct current. current. And one time I gave a presentation and found out the hard way when it burned out my slide projector. Uh, so, uh, but sisters generated their own with their own, what the smokestack then heralding the approach to Oldenburg. My mother always said, when I'd say, are we there yet? She says, look for the smoke. And then you see the smoke. And then soon after you'd see the spires because the, the smoke of course was, was, was uh, above the spires. And then also agricultural architecture. This is the sister's barn which is entirely made of brick and it was a dairy barn, but it was built on the site of the brewery, <clears throat> the Rell Brewery. There, in my analysis of Oldenburg, uh, which I did for the National Register nomination, but also for this paper, and then I also had another paper in graduate school on the material culture, the German material culture of Oldenburg. And anyway, I looked at the four periods, four periods of the pioneer pre-brickyard, 1837, 1858, <clears throat> and then the brickyard changes. And the brickyard is a game changer. Father Franz Joseph Rudolph realized if he is gonna have a real town with these, great, with these great institutions, bricks are easier and faster to lay than, than quarrying the stone. So this brickyard is the game changer. He invites Beatus Gehring, who originally had come from Baden, and he, he uh, purchased the land for a farm and, and a brickyard, which operates for 50 years, <clears throat> which of course closes out the 19th century. The post brickyard period is, uh, is the, the first uh, uh, 40 years of the 20th century. And then after that, we have the post-war period, which then in introduces buildings more or less where you could find just about anywhere. <clears throat> the, the first period, the pioneer period, is the period from 1837 to 1858. And that produced half timber or Fachwerk buildings and stone buildings, which we'll look at. Second period. <clears throat> and so I just showed you this, this building has wood and mud walls. And, or at least it did originally. And this building has brick walls. So it's heavy timber frame. All the joints are notched and pinned together but the, the spaces between the studs are filled in with bricks. And oftentimes those were not hard fired bricks, but were 
uh, a softer, but they were always covered up. This is the Fetty Piney House, right, uh, right across the street from the church. <clears throat> and many of those older houses are along Water Street because of its uh, uh, closeness, proximity to the Harvey's branch. Now, there's another, another phenomena here, which puzzled me. And finally, Eberhard Reichmann told me, why are these, and I asked him, why are these logs laid uh, perpendicular to the course of the creek? And he said, oh, I saw that in Bavaria. On laundry day, the women would go down to the creek, they could sit on the logs, and then wash the clothes. And the, the water, of course, would be trapped in, into pools uh, between the logs, depending on the, uh, the level of the water. And also they could do their scrubbing of the clothing on the logs as well. That made perfect sense. I don't know if those are still there. I hope they are, but they had, had been there. When I took this picture, they had been there well over a hundred years. <clears throat> and these buildings from this first period uh, these half timber buildings were always covered with uh, clapboards. They were never exposed like the ones you'd see in Germany. Why are they covered with clapboards? Because the wood was readily available. There was wood everywhere. And this made them more watertight. <clears throat> and of course, we'll find this is a, a building function as a barn and a house in Oldenburg, Germany, in Northern Germany. And then we have in ruins, the Fachwerk, uh, uh, the half timbering in Oldenburg. And you can see the mud. And these are sl slats, oak slats, which would fit into the uh, cavities of the, uh, uh, between the studs. And then it was all woven with, uh, sometimes with branches and then covered with mud. The mud might be even mixed in with straw or even manure as a binder, uh, just as it was in medieval times. This is authentic, authentic um, medieval construction. And uh, there, there are a number of houses that still have that. Uh, then of course we have a number of stone houses. And of course the stone church I've mentioned, stone houses, cottage. This is on Water Street. Uh, this is on Main Street. And some of these, some of these, such as on the corner, are dress stones, as you can see that as well. And then some of it is laid up in coarse rubble stone. <clears throat> that coarse, those dress stones took a lot of skill. You had skilled masons who were coring the stone and then dressing it for for use. <clears throat> also in Oldenburg, uh, well, north of Oldenburg is a is a two spanned um, a stone arch uh, um, bridge. And then in Oldenburg itself, right there on Water Street, <clears throat> is the uh, is the single arch. These stone uh, barrel vaulted uh, uh, stone bridges are still functioning. <clears throat> now here's a view of the um, the old stone church. It had already been converted into the friary after 1866, and because no longer function as a church because the brick church was finished in 1862. So the stone church then becomes a friary of the home for the friars. And, and then in 1894, the large um, seminary, uh, the uh, friary and seminary was constructed. <clears throat> you can see the friars there on the building site. And you can also see the dome, the onion dome, which was completely made of wood and those are wooden shingles, which are colored and patterned as well. And in 1949, it lost its dome. It was in disrepair. So instead of repairing it, they just, just took it down. So from 1949 until uh, 2010, it looked like this. Now, I, one of the most, <clears throat> and that onion dome, of course, the German name is Zwiebelturm, which means onion tower. And uh, the the and that church, I'm going to go back to that. The plan of this church is unusual because the altar would have been at this end. The entry into the church was at the at the west end, which is liturgically correct. But the tower was would have been right right behind the altar, <clears throat> as opposed to at the at the um, entrance end, which was which struck me as a little unusual. 
Now, the most important uh, stone house is the Hugel house. And uh, Josef Hugel and his wife, Elizabeth Hugel, built this house in 1845. And it is a really a large house and it was enlarged over time. And if you look closely, that's not rubble stonework, that's all dressed quarried stone. So he spent a lot of money on this house. It's where he lived, but he also uh, operated as an inn. And as an inn, uh, then he would take in, uh, of course, visitors to town. Most of them were not, they were not, not there for the sightseers. <clears throat> but one of the businesses was across the street. There was a corral for livestock to be overnight because in the time before railroads, livestock was driven on foot to the markets in Cincinnati. That includes, that includes poultry as well as uh, pigs, uh, cattle, horses, sheep, everything was driven on foot. So it had to have a whole group of drovers. And so for the evening, they would corral their uh, livestock and then would, could find accommodations here in the tavern. And of course, this is one of the 14 taverns. And what also is very unusual about this is that it has a mitered arch so it comes to a point and that, that helps, of course, to alleviate the pressure uh, by creating a doorway. And then it has this wonderful lintel. And the lintel is carved. So it's a nut. he spent some more money and had a skilled carver produce this. And uh, it has the, the, the sun, <clears throat> the sun, sorry, the sun and the moon. And of course, if you go to Waffle House, uh, you know, that chain restaurant, you also see their logo is the sun and the moon because as an inn, it was open at all times. Then we have this wonderful ribbon. On the ribbon, which then is, is behind this beautiful wreath. And by the way, there's a ribbon, a small ribbon and a nail that's carved. The nail holds up the wreath. This is all very literal. And there is a ribbon which holds I-H-E-H. -E and that means initials of Josef Hugel and his wife, Elizabeth Hugel. And also this made it easy for me, it says 1845 carved into the stone. So there's no guesswork there. They made it easy for me. And then we come to the brickyard era starting 1858, numerous brick buildings were constructed, including this double, the Selmeyer double right on, on Main Street. And of course, it's a very spacious double. So it's two and a half stories in height with a stone foundation. It's right next to the Selmeyer Burdick store. And Burdick then later added this wonderful stamped sheet metal cornice with his name in Fraktur, uh, J.F. Uh, Burdick. And these window hoods as well. <clears throat> Now I've mentioned the Gehring Farm. The Gehring Farm is immediately south of Oldenburg. It's also lit part of the National Register nomination. This house, there's that uh, wonderful uh, corn crib that I mentioned. And the roof of this house is made of uh, tile, roof tile. And uh, which is the only house that still has its uh, uh, tile roof. I don't know if there were others. I wouldn't doubt it because they also made the, the roof tile and the roof tile then were, of course, made locally. There's no shipping problem. It becomes inexpensive. Of course, the bricks were used for the church. The school here is from the 1930s, which was not made of local brick. <clears throat> the monastery of 1894 was uh, made of local Gehring brick. The addition here, because this also became a, the seminary, what the seminary library, which was uh, fireproof. This was, this was an addition. So the portion here was not local uh, Gehring brick, <clears throat> but also the, the great complex of the sisters. Uh, everything built between 1858 to 188 were made of, of the Gehring brick, including that wonderful barn that the sisters commissioned. <clears throat> and I've mentioned these tiles. So this is what they look like. This is on a summer, uh, a summer kitchen and a house on Pearl Street. 
as you can see, it's in pretty good shape. A couple, a couple slate, or at least one slate in this point of view is broken. That could easily be uh, be uh, repaired, so it, becomes, it remains to be serviceable rather than continuous to leak and then rot the uh, structure. This is what the uh, tile looked like. Mr. Gehring let me borrow this, and I took pictures of it. And what I love about it is, do you see this, this little uh, thumb? you could hang these tile without using a nail because they would hang. And I saw uh, uh, these all over Germany, a historical tile exactly like that because there's a little thumb and that thumb then uh, hangs, hangs the tile on the uh, wooden slat, the sheathing board. And of course, the sisters built this wonderful wall, only one portion of it remains, which was to enclose their entire campus. This is along Pearl Street, the only portion that has survived. There's also uh, brick paved sidewalks. Some of these have disappeared since uh, I wrote this paper, uh, but of course, those were local brick. Brick was abundant. It was everywhere. The Garings produced the brick. <clears throat> now, after the brickyard closes, um, there's, they revert to wood frame construction. The wood frame construction then is typical late 19th century, early 20th century, uh, called balloon construction with two by four studs and so on. So there's an abandonment uh, of, uh, of that uh, older uh, wood frame construction with the heavy timber frame. And this, is, this house is right on Water Street, but it's uh, also, I know it's got a concrete block uh, foundation as well. <clears throat> and then also uh, bungalows, of course, ubiquitous in every American city in the 19 aughts, the teens, and into the 1920s. Of course, we find them here in Oldenburg. And then we come to that post-war era, we find buildings, and this is on Washington Street. Uh, this one was built in the 19... Uh, late 60s or 70s. And of course, this is a ranch house, which you can find <clears throat> anywhere in the United States, or also um, a colonial, sort of a colonial revival cottage, as we see with this one also from the post-war period. And then, of course, a gas station. And the gas station then of, uh, has... Also, the Obermeyers are conscious of being in a historic town, so they use a sort of a, a, a German script with coats of arms. Uh, I don't know if those are authentic, but they're certainly in the spirit of, of, of the place. And then we come to another aspect of the, uh, of the craftsmanship and the building traditions. And that is <clears throat> the, thanks to the skill of local tin and blacksmiths, there is an abundance of decorative of metalwork. And this, the most, the magnificent, the most magnificent expression of that is the Hockman store, uh, built in 1862 by Anton Hockman. But it was, it was this building. But it, it, it was enhanced with stamped sheet metal, hoods, and orioles, and the uh, storefront facades that look like stone uh, rustication. And also, there's an acroterion. So all this was made of sheet metal. And that's because of the skill of Kasper Galpel and his son-in-law who joined him, whose name was Schmidt. And uh, Galpel then produced numerous uh, examples of architectural enhancement. And these are just wonderful. These would be called orioles. So they're a projection out, uh, cantilevered out from the wall providing just a little window space, <clears throat> all, and this is all in the German Renaissance revival style. And the building across the street, which was the, the Shepherd store, and also uh, more, more, probably in more recent memory, it was the Farmers and Merchant State Bank. Also has that rusticated uh, pier work, the hood, and then a wonderful uh, cornice. I don't know if it used to have a name emblazoned up in this panel, but that's what that panel was created for. <clears throat> and then my great grandfather bought a one story house. He put a second story on it and then added this Oriole, which is all stamped sheet metal work uh, for, his, uh, for his growing family. And his name was uh, William Holker. And, but William Holker's uh, brother-in-law 
uh, Piney b had this carriage house built, which also was his paint shop because he was a paint church decorator, but also with a magnificent, uh, uh, a magnificent uh, cornice. Now we go to the ironwork. This is um, a, a lamppost there in front of the sisters' chapel. This is all the work of a skilled blacksmith. I cannot, I cannot say if there was a local blacksmith that created that, or if it was, <clears throat> or if it was commissioned. <coughs> excuse me, commissioned by um, by the sisters <clears throat> from uh, a, a larger operation, maybe in Cincinnati or Indianapolis. I can't tell, but we still have this wonderful ironwork express and also simplified ironwork in this grill. This is on the Hockman store. The window behind this grill work is, is glass because that allows light it down into the, uh, down into the cellar. Uh, but also this is all the work of a skilled blacksmith, probably done locally. <clears throat> and then to my delight, um, when I went go out to the cemetery, <clears throat> of course the old stones are all inscribed in German. But also what we have there, most of them are stone, but we also have a, a typical German tradition of, of uh, iron grave markers, the, the uh, Grabkreuz. And in this case, some are, there's one or two that are wrought iron, but uh, most of them are cast iron. And these were made locally because the name of the manufacturer in Oldenburg is, is on the back side of these. <clears throat> so this would have had a nameplate here, which has been lost, which was uh, in stamped sheet metal. This one's still intact uh, with, with the name of the, of the deceased. And there's an arrow pointing that that's where the deceased is, where he rests in God. We come back to that wonderful, <clears throat> magnificent uh, skyline. And the skyline is, and I think visitors are amazed, enlightened in visitors, I'll put it that way, are amazed to see that this is not a museum town. There are not costumed <clears throat> interpreters, but this is where a, a, a working town, uh, but it is so complete and so intact and it's really so magnificent with its small cottages. And you can see the, this is at, at Wine and Pearl Street or Perlin and Weinstrasse. By the way, they were renamed in German uh, in the 1970s, by the way. Uh, not in, when it was platted, it was all in English. And the streets are named after the streets in, uh, mostly in over the Rhine in Cincinnati. <clears throat> there is the salt box roof, which allows uh, a dish, probably an addition on the back. And then we have uh, still some of these reminders. This Oldenburg's integrity <clears throat> is not threatened by change, which comes from people wanting to demolish and build something bigger, like in big cities. But oftentimes it's these historic structures, the integrity is, uh, is uh, threatened by ignorance or poor design or apathy <clears throat> or um, aluminum siding or just plain lack of maintenance. This was the oldest house in town. And uh, this really captivated me because it was so authentic. Everything here was made by hand. Everything here was essentially behind that uh, weatherboarding. It was really medieval. It's a German building from the Middle Ages, which was then recreated here with a central stone chimney. Change happens, happens in increments, uh, not, not in great waves. You have a lot of stability. You have people who are living there whose grandparents live there or their Grand, great grandparents or their great great grandparents live there. <clears throat> and so we do have a, a lot of stability. It's the same people. They're there. And many of them do appreciate that what their ancestors did for them. But then again, we have lack of understanding. There you can see the mud between those, between those uh, uh, jointed studs. There it is on the inside. I was so lucky to be able to go through this building before it was demolished. <clears throat> and when it was demolished, I went back and just took a picture of what was standing with the, the rubble stone uh, chimney. Now you can see the fireplace. So we know that this was a very, very old house. I would say this was the oldest building in Oldenburg. Now, another old building that was also lost <clears throat> was uh, known as the Pete, Pete Pistner Saloon. But before that, it was the Bauernheim 
Bauenheim, the Farmer's Home Saloon. <clears throat> and this building was very interesting because it has a Greek revival storefront, which was popular, of course, in, leading up to the Civil War. It looks like a Greek temple. You know, there are the, use your imagination, there are the columns, right? Columns, and they're supporting the entablature, and the entablature is the lower portion of the Greek pediment. So it's a Greek building or Greek inspired building. So this was also one of those 14 stations. And by the way, the board was painted with the names. And at one point, I think some of that has been saved. You could still see the Fraktur lettering uh, under, under the coats of paint. <clears throat> and as time went on, uh, a house was built which served as a residence. Remember that tradition, you, you have the house, you have the house and the business all under one roof. Well, it did, the oldest part didn't survive, but I can see, you know, I'm using the archaeology provided now, <clears throat> is that the, that is typical uh, stud construction of two by fours, so that I know that this is that this is uh, late uh, late nineteenth century, early twentieth century, probably built after the brickyard, <clears throat> and it it was then a perpendicular addition to Pissner's uh, saloon. And then we can see in a change over time, uh, plastic and, and aluminum siding. These two buildings are half timber cottages. I know that because uh, the owner, I knocked on the door, the owner let, let me in and let me up in the attic so I could observe it. <clears throat> and then this one is made of uh, uh, brick, maybe stone, because it's, it's for the longest time it's been stuccoed. But there you can see some inappropriate, this was the commercial entrance, uh, inappropriate uh, uh, blocking down of openings and putting in smaller windows, which just don't fit. This building on Main Street, <clears throat> right near the church, functioned as a commercial building. This half, there's the commercial entrance, and then a residential entrance. This one still has the remnant of the staircase going up to where the entrance uh, was into the store. And there you can see where the, the, the windows have been uh, shortened and the door has been removed. This would have been a, a double leaf door with those wonderful staircase going up. And of course there's an entrance here so that the goods can be taken down to the keller <clears throat> to, serve, uh, to warehouse them uh, the goods so they could be sold later. And we can see some of those changes here as well with the um, uh, blocking down um, uh, openings such as this 1960s door here. <clears throat> and there you can see eventually what happened to this building. It was blocked down with plywood and uh, well, it, it just doesn't fit and it's not respectful for the original original building. <clears throat> we can see in some cases trying to make the buildings look older and just ignoring the historical the historical building in its own character, such as this entrance. It looks German, I suppose. Uh, this is in nearby Batesville and the and it's well designed. It looks good, but it really doesn't fit onto this building. That's this is part of this ethic of, of historic preservation of, of respecting the building's character. And as I said, that these are two commercial buildings and sometimes the, the, the additions, the changes just, just don't look right. I've mentioned this one before, the tile roof. And some of these are just some, <clears throat> some aspects that could easily, could easily be um, remedied if one would know how to do that such as the erosion of the mortar here. Eventually the, the whole thing could collapse with the mortar going out and then of course the roof leaking and so on, but it's fairly easily to remedy if one knows how to do it. <clears throat> the town hall for its uh, centennial was sandblasted, which is the worst thing you could ever do to a brick building. Of course, <laughs> at the time they didn't understand that. Uh, because when I arrived there in 1978, they were just finishing repointing reporting the building after it had been sandblasted. I did some restoration myself. This is the before and after of the Eiserne Grabkreuze uh, there in the Holy Family Cemetery. 
And it was a delight. These are cast iron and I just took wire brush to them, got the rust off, primed them and then painted and then got gold paint to accent the, uh, the corpus of Christ as well as the rays. The Franciscan friary was, a, was on the horizon as a preservation problem because um, a few years earlier, so uh, uh, in the 70s, the, the uh, seminary was closed. This building of three stories with a full attic and a full basement was largely empty. And the plans were, they didn't, they had no plans for it. So that was going to be a preservation issue coming up. And so Historic Landmarks Foundation and the newly formed Oldenburg Preservation Association uh, co-sponsored this uh, workshop, Oldenburg Past and Future. <clears throat> and I was still in graduate school when this happened. And I also led the, my first walking tour of Oldenburg. There I am uh, well, 40 years ago. And I can happy to see that there are sisters in the audience because the sisters property was just across on the other side of the street. So Oldenburg is a view from 1901 and my view from 1980 in the winter fog. And there you can see those wonderful spires, including that wonderful distinctive onion dome. But as I said, it is the friary, which is located here, which is an issue. So since 1982, that presentation, <clears throat> uh, again, I like to measure thing from this photograph when you see Oldenburg in its glory. So since uh, this is by my uh, uh, rough accounting, since 82, the losses have been the Franciscan friary, the Fisher blacksmith shop, the Fockwerk Fock cottage on the park alley, some of the brick paved sidewalks, and then the Hackman store was lost by fire just recently. It's not, the, it's the small wooden barn behind the store. So again, when looking at this, they brought in people from the University of Miami from the architecture school to also start addressing this issue of reuse. And also, as I said, on my honeymoon of 1980, my wife and I worked to collect information, and then I took it back to Boston and uh, worked on the uh, National Register nomination. I made the mistake of putting the wrong date on this newspaper article, by the way. Uh, that's not, a, that's not, that's a, a bad thing for a historian to do. That is my handwriting. <clears throat> but uh, it was listed in the National Register, which was a dream of my friend Gilbert Munchell. As I mentioned before, the Oldenburg Preservation Association was formed as to, to make people aware of uh, issues, especially the one with the monastery coming up. And so there were meetings and I attended many of these driving from Indianapolis. And then in 83, uh, thanks to the Oldenburg Preservation Association, you can see its coat of arms here and Historic Landmarks Foundation of Indiana. Uh, uh, I, I wrote and uh, researched and wrote this uh, walking tour guide, again, to make people aware of what they have. <clears throat> and so the, there is the Franciscan Friary and Seminary. There's the back side of it. There's this uh, stone church. And so we had an effort when nothing was happening. There was just nothing was, it, it was on a collision course. So Indiana German Heritage Society sprang into action to assist the Oldenburg Preservation Association to have a campaign to try to save the monastery, including making bumper stickers. And then I was there on a, on a grant project recording historical archives, and I witnessed the, the heartbreak. This was just heartbreaking. I had been in the building. I had been up in the attic. There was no leak in the roof. Not one window was broken. It was, it was just sitting empty and could have easily have been rehabilitated. And it's, as I said, it's a heartbreaker. Gone, simply because there was no imagination. Even the wall here was taken down, the uh, privacy wall. So again, looking back on these historical views, we see the spires, Onion Dome is here, the Zwiebelturm, 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 Zwiebelturm sticking out there. And I'm, I'm, 
a, a very happy event happened on the 3rd of February of, of 2010. The Onion Dome returns to the skyline and my friend Jeff Paul, that's his son carrying the Oldenburg flag and there's a lot of town pride, I'm happy to say. And there we are on top of it and there's the view of it. And there is the prefabricated, the prefabricated uh, Zwiebelturm, which was manufactured by um, uh, uh, Campbell uh, in Northern Kentucky. It was shipped up by, uh, on a truck, crane set in place and it, there it is being set. And someone in Oldenburg wrote this, congratulations Oldenburg, it's, it's an historic day and it is. It was a day of great happiness. And there it is on top of the tower. Now this is all made of metal as opposed to the original one, but it's to scale, all the details are there. It's wonderful. And it, it restores the skyline with that very, very distinctive German tower, the Zwiebelturm. I have a lot of hope in Oldenburg. I see the town flag everywhere which comes from the coat of arms of the Grand, uh, Grand Duchy of Oldenburg. There's pride in the spires and the Oldenburg Freudenfest is an annual festival. Well, the last two years hasn't, it's coming back. Uh, and there you see a lot of town pride and there's a lot of energy and you have a lot of leadership. We had a gap in leadership uh, when the time the monastery went down. And also in November of this past year, this house, the Hugel house was being rescued because it was looking pretty shabby. The uh, owner is renovating it. And inside he had exposed the Fachwerk, authentic Fachwerk interior walls of this. And there they are, those branches which are woven through the slats, which then are adhered to the studs, which are all hand hewn and then covered with straw and mud and then covered with plaster. It's all there. This is authentic medieval uh, architecture. And again, going back to this past and future, uh, it has a magnificent past. The future could be wonderful. We have more people, more people on board. And one ex good example of that is this is the Hockman store. There was an addition. And of course, all the metal work was added in the 1890s, as was the residential wing. The person that owns this house, it was his great, great grandfather who built it. So Anton Hockman, his son, A.A. A. Hockman did the addition. And then Chris Munchel uh, lives there now with his son. So that is seven generations living under one roof continuously. That's pretty magnificent. And that's also so German. I just want to point out that this is Wilhelm Holker because my he rented this building from from A. A. Hockman. They had many business business uh, dealings, and so he had the store uh, with his sons for fifty years. So there he is with his employees, right on the corner of of Pearl and uh, Main Street, just up the uh, catty corner from the church. And it was his father who was the tailor, who was also one of the organizers of the, of the Oldenburg Eagle Fire Company. It is not the Oldenburg Fire Company. It is not the Oldenburg Volunteer Fire Company. It is the Eagle Fire Company. And it, that's the original name and it keeps that. And there they are posed on, right in front of the Old Stone Church before the, uh, uh, the uh, Friary was built. And there is the there is the south wall of the, whole, the present Holy Family Brick Church. He's a tailor, so I imagine he made a little money on probably sewing all those uniforms. Now, I'm, running, I'm coming to the end here, and I wanted to thank Gilbert Munchel. I spent many hours talking to him, sitting on the swing, visiting him. He was a, he was a protege of Florentine Holger, my grandfather. And then, so his, he, we talked and talked, he shared his information with me. <clears throat> and so I was able to do the national register nomination. Uh, he was a real inspiration to me. And of course, my grandfather inspired him. I like that connection. And it's, and it's his grandson that owns the building now.
and lives there. So I say, thank you, Gilbert. And that's the end. Well, th thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. That was fascinating, of course. And um, for I'll turn it over to our panel for any comments. Uh, they need to unmute themselves. Yeah. If you will unmute yourself there. One, one second here, uh, Giles. Let okay. me I'm particularly interested in the um, connection to the area surrounding Oldenburg. Now, Oldenburg was a, a significant town in cultural terms, religious terms, but also economic terms. That's obvious from the, the buildings there. They, it's, it was prosperous. It's so prosperous. it served a wider area and its connections were less to Indianapolis, for example, then to the much closer Cincinnati. And there I'd like to hear from, from Don Heinrich about the, how he sees this, these links, uh, because as you're saying, even the, the, the uh, farm animals and so forth, the, the cattle were driven to, to Cincinnati, uh, not to Indianapolis. And I assume that a lot of the people, products, so forth, that were sold used in in Oldenburg and the surrounding areas would have come up from the south, uh, from the southeast rather than from the northwest uh, in, the, in from the capital. Uh, and of course, the, uh, the river isn't too far away either. So um, we, we could get some comments on that from our panel. Don? Yes, can you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. I wanted to make sure you could hear me. What well, the two done are so close because of not only the distance, but Cincinnati was the a destination and distribution center for people throughout the region. And one important connection point was that German Catholic paper, the Wahrheitsfreund, that was read so much and land speculators they um, who planted the town and set that up. They advertised in the paper uh, a lot about Oldenburg. And then the church connections, too, with the Catholic Church in Cincinnati, and then in Indiana, Fernandin, who was in New Alsace, which is not far off from uh, Oldenburg. But I see so many things that were brought up by Bill that remind a uh, reminiscent of things in Cincinnati. Uh, here people wore wooden shoes in, in the farming areas. They're quite common to see wooden shoes. And people, were, we have some at the German Heritage Museum, but people would put wo uh, woolen socks on or even stuff them with straw. Right. Um, which was interesting. And uh, one thing I noticed, we do have, log buildings and half timber, but they tended to cover them with clapboard to protect the wood of the logs because they tended to deteriorate. And I found it here, usually within 10 years, they would put on clapboard. So it's hard to detect some of these buildings that they actually are log or, or half timber. I don't know if, you, if Bill has had that experience at all, but that has happened. Uh, yeah, I, I sure have, Don Heinrich, and that's why I was, I was, when I'd find suspect buildings, I would, I would knock on the door and ask the people, what are the walls made of? And I'd say, mud, mud and wood, yes. Or you say, wood and brick. So, you know, if you get the wood and the brick, of course, that's called brick nogging, the English term. And that's typical of medieval construction. And then when they don't fill them in, that's going to be that, that later phase when they're adopting more conventional uh, American building um, techniques. And that's going to be after the Civil War. Uh -huh. But you're right what? about Cincinnati. Don Heinrich, up in the attic of the Hockman store, there's a box of receipts. And the receipts are largely from Cincinnati wholesalers. 
So, uh, and just about anything you can imagine. So my, my great grandfather, Wilhelm Holker, he, he didn't say it's a general store. He said it's a department store. And in department store, he organized it, you know, glassware. You could buy butter and eggs because uh, he traded with, uh, with uh, uh, farmers and also sent out a huckster truck uh, to, to bargain and, and collect uh, produce. So aside from that very fresh stuff, everything was largely coming from Cincinnati. And then also there was a receipt from, uh, from Lud Ludwig Hudapol saying, please pay the bill. So uh, it's everything we, I, I grew up at Brookville. So we were definitely in the Cincinnati wow. sphere of influence. Went to, went to Indianapolis only for the state fair. That's it. <laughs> in German Renaissance Revival buildings, we see that quite prominently in the late 19th century in Cincinnati. It was a very prominent building style uh, preceded by a lot of Gothic, uh, well, earlier Romanesque styles. One thing I wanted to notice about the linguistic situation I find interesting that Father Rudolph was an Alsatian yeah. And he is in a North German town, Oldenburg. And then Kernadeng is over in New Alsace with Alsatians. And he's in Oldenburg. Right. <laughs> something you do not see in the old country. We're having Alsatians up in the Grand Duchy of Oldenburg. But that must have been interesting linguistically to have Alsatians with Plattdeutsch speakers. And I wonder oh. if there was any comment Bill, that you noticed about the linguistic situation on that? Uh, I, I've never seen anything. I've also uh, pondered that, uh, that <laughs> linguistic dilemma. But of course, you know, if, if of course the priest would know Hochdeutsch, high German. Mm -hmm. And so as a bridge, uh, as a bridge from, from the, the two dialects, or you say if it's, if it's Plattdeutsch, it, it, okay, not a dialect, but a language. But of course, uh, Hochdeutsch would have been the bridge. And then of course, liturgically, it's Latin. Uh, but uh, also Fernanding, see, was the first pastor in Oldenburg. It's Fernanding's idea. He founds the first parish. He found, he, it's his idea to have a town. <coughs> it's Rudolph then who comes and expands that vision. And Rudolph as an Alsatian, these priests were loved. They, they were the great, they were the, the great civic and spiritual leaders. People looked to them. They got things done. You know, the schools, uh, the bricks, uh, you know, from soup to nuts, essentially. And then, and then when he's, he peace, uh, arranges for his successor, he brings in the Tyrolean uh, friars, Franciscan friars from Cincinnati. Well, the church is so important. I think in some of these small towns, New Alsace and Oldenburg, the history of the church and the history of the town are one and the same thing. That's exactly right. It's this complete uh, unity of, of people and culture. Exactly right. Because the, the history of the parish cannot be separated from the history of the town. They're one and the same. Well, I just yes. want to congratulate you. I thought it was a wonderful presentation. It was so informative and interesting and well illustrated. So, well, thank you. Just excellent, excellent. And I, I still, I still have that bumper sticker. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of our big tragedies: is losing that. that was, remember, we were all part of that uh, uh, sure. protest movement down there and tried to move the. Archdiocese to uh, think about saving the building is something else, but um, they were intransigent. And that what year was that? Uh, 19. 86 uh, is when the dem demolition was. 86? 1986. 86. 85, 86, we tried to. Uh, we, I spent, I spent there. many hours meeting, I spent many miles on the road. I'm, you know, I remember hearing about it and reading here's about it. Here's the problem. If the owner doesn't want to do it, then you're, you're stuck. You, we even had a lawsuit. Um, and I, so yes. I, was on the, I was on the docket as a witness uh, trying to stave the execution, uh, the demolition, I should say.
Did, was there anything that replaced it? Is it a vacant lot or what, what's there oh, now? It's open, open green space. Even the wall was taken down. And it remains that to this day. No. So, so it's not they had to remove it to build something else. It was just to get rid of the building. It was a cost of the diocese and they did not want to pay for it. Yeah. 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 No, this has so many parallels. Has so many parallels to Ferdinand and Jasper. Of course. Especially Ferdinand. Where I come from. John and I come from. Especially Ferdinand, uh, because yeah. they're the, the, the most important architectural uh, feature is the uh, is the Benedictine convent for the sisters. That is this that it it dominates the town. And in Oldenburg, there's no hill, but it's that whole all the spires. You know, yeah. they, give, they give it that character. My and Ferdinand uh, has three spires. I mean, they've got a chapel up on the hill and then the, the city church. But yes, the, the history of Ferdinand is just synonymous with the history of the Catholic Church. <laughs> right. Ferdinand. That from that, the, the relation, was there a relationship at all between <clears throat> um, that Catholic area, the Dubai County area, and the Oldenburg area. Um, it does not seem to be the case. It seems that the connection for, for um, Jasper and so forth is further into the south toward the river. And they, that immigration route, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. versus Oldenburg, uh, Cincinnati connection where, um, where the, the, the transportation routes were up from the Ohio down on Cincinnati. And we have the one further north uh, through Richmond, the National Road, which seems to be another travel route. And these things remain rather disparate. Is that correct? Yeah, I don't, I don't know of any connect. I, when I first went to Ferdinand, I think, well, this is like Oldenburg. I mean, it's a small village. Uh, you know, your main industry, so to speak, is the church as evident by the architecture. And, you know, and then the sisters down there also had an academy and then a college. The sisters in Oldenburg had an academy from, from the beginning and then had a college. And eventually they bought real estate in Indianapolis and that's called Marion University now. So the origins of Marion University are, is that one sister, that heroic sister, Sister uh, Teresa Hockelmeyer coming by herself across the Atlantic to New York, to Cincinnati, to Oldenburg, and arriving there on the Feast of the Three Kings of 1851. <laughs> Who was there to welcome her? The Alsatian priest, Father Franz Joseph Rudolph, with, new, with recruits ready for the convent and the building nearing completion, ready for her. So he, huh? he and she are the co-founders. It's his idea, plus he has everything ready for them. One when we when we meet for art again next year, down in hopefully down in in Basel, Oldenburg, uh, Don Heinrich, I'd particularly be interested. You sent us an article, some of us, an article that you wrote uh, regarding New Elsass, and I would really like to hear more about that. So I'd like to put you on, on the docket already for for next year when we examine that air, greater region um, and its its connection, particularly to um, I mean, versus the economic as well as the cultural, religious reasons, uh, how that all connected. And, but clearly, we have different groups of Germans coming in, uh, the Alsatians and, of course, the Oldenburgers from the Duchy of Oldenburg, and others that, um, that define the culture of the areas. So if we could add you to, to the list and continue that conversation next year. I think that's so interesting, these regional settlements that are defined by the place of origin, the Alsatians, the Oldenburgers, how they concentrate. And we see that in Ohio, well, throughout the Midwest, how they, they focus like that. Another settlement I was wondering about is in Illinois, Toitopolis. Yeah. And <laughs> apparently these land speculators, they also old, owned land there and sent Oldenburgers out to Toitopolis. I want to ask Bill about that connection. If you looked into Toitopolis and then any connections with Oldenburg. Yes, there is a connection. 
uh, I visited Teutopolis, which is in Effingham County, Illinois. So it's not that far from Terre Haute. And um, <clears throat> they, uh, they published a his their history, I think in the 30s. And uh, I, when I went through that history, I saw the names of the, of the organizers of this company to start this town. And there were the names of Ronnebaum and Plaspol. So they were Cincinnati, North German Catholics. And uh, the, the idea was to have a, another uh, Catholic town. And then eventually it, it was a center for the Franciscans because they had a seminary and the friary. The seminary has been knocked down, but the friary has remained and townspeople then turn it into a museum with different families in charge of uh, maintaining the different uh, friars cells for the exhibits. I was very impressed with it and say, when did I see that? That was in, that was 1982. So uh, it'd be worth, it, worth a visit to check that out. And, uh, what's and the, what's the connection, stuff, what's yeah, the Titopolis connection to Indianapolis? Uh, well, there is a connection, and that goes in with the polis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you've, got, you've got the polis. Well, that's Greek. Um, but the connection also is, is those friars were connected to Sacred Heart. The, the, yes, Sacred Heart. That's exactly right. Because that, that was a friary church, a, 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 yeah. close, a close to Kelsey. That's right. So there was that, that link because the, it seemed also the Indianapolis Catholic area was also not very connected to either the Oldenburg or the, the uh, Du Bois County. Uh, Catholic well, communities. Now, the Indianapolis Catholics were because it's the Sisters of St. Francis that taught at uh, the St. Mary's, uh, the uh, parish school. They also taught in other parish schools, such as the Slovenian <laughs> uh, parish in Hallville, and also at, uh, let's see, what was it, St. Bridget's, which later became a Black, a black parish starting out Irish. So the sisters were there in a number of parishes and they also operated uh, St. Mary's Academy, which was a high school and which of course was built right behind St. Mary's church. And though those priests there of course would have been uh, aware of Father, uh, is it Scheidler, Jim, Father Scheidler, uh, the, the founding priest there at St. Mary's he he would have he would have been in touch with the other priests according uh, of course with uh, in Oldenburg as well. They were all connected, especially in this diocese. And um, the uh, so you did have the you certainly have these connections, and of course it's the sisters coming from Oldenburg who are teaching in the schools and they start they start the high school St. Mary's. So yes. They're connected, just as in the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, the monasteries spawn more monasteries, spawn more monasteries. They're all connected, and that's where we get both a, a religious Catholic culture as well as a Western a Western civilization, which is disseminated thanks to the connections of the monasteries. But from a genealogical standpoint, there wasn't a lot of bleed over from those different areas. There was a, uh, certainly a Catholic educational connection through the yeah. nuns, but right. genealogically, they were kind of separated. Right. Uh, because, you know, the names that you find down in Chasper and, and, uh, and uh, St. Anthony and uh, Ferdinand and St. Meinrad and, uh, and Folda. Celestine. Yeah, you, Celestine. Those, unless it's Schmidt. <laughs> yeah. unless it's Schmidt. Uh, you know, you, you probably they won't find common names, Schmidt or Kaiser, yeah. I suppose. Um, but, you know, th those those names you find in Oldenburg, you know, are, are, some are very distinctive. And so I'll tell you a joke that my grandfather told, uh, and it has to do with German, German names in Oldenburg. <clears throat> so in the 1920s, a farmer comes into town, goes to the tavern, one of 14, 
And uh, of course it's in the twenties, so he has to buy it illegally. Uh, so he goes into the tavern and says, well, we finally got a German in the lighthouse. And they, they look at him and says, well, what are you talking about? He said, well, we got here in Oldenburg, we've got the Wayloggies, the Hydeloggies, and the Freihoggies. And in Washington, D.C., in the White House, we have Calvin Kulagi. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, uh, Grandpa told that joke. Uh, obviously, he thought it was funny in the 20s. And so I retell it. I also told one of the Brahmins in Boston, whose name was Cool, and she politely laughed, of course. So um, it was polite. That hog at the end of a name is certainly a Northern German. Yeah. Way yeah. hoggy. Uh, right. It is. It is. Camp, K A M P and then Meyer, M A Y E R, or M M E Y E R. But, and um, then we have the, 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 the two families, let's see. Uh, that have put their first names in the in the last name to distinguish, and I'm, I'm going blank, but um, Katter Johan and Katter Heinrich, and there's uh, that's a real German Northern German method of names. And yeah, you know, I know Giles oh. had mentioned uh, wait, uh, wait Jim, a year. Jim Kane, un, unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. Jim, 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 unmute yourself. Oh, can't hear him. One second, <laughs> he's coming. I found an article in the Indianapolis News from around 1908, or around there, and the article was where Lent is really kept. So the reporter went to St. Meinrad the reporter went to Oldenburg and the reporter went to um, uh, South Bend to Notre Dame. Yeah. And then when he, he, he's describing Oldenburg, he's, he remarks, German is spoken on the streets, in the shops, it's just everywhere. It's as though you're not in the United States because there was, he'd heard no English spoken. And, and what uh, year was that? I th uh, 1908, 1910. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to go, I got the citation, I got to go back and find that article, but it was a great article with that insight. And, and it was absolutely true. Um, my, my mother, now my mother was born in 18, that terrible year. And my mother, you know, I, I, I became aware of this stuff as a child, because my grandparents could speak German. And once in a while, I could coax them to, to say German things to me. And uh, all my grandparents could. So I, uh, well, then I took German classes. And then, of course, I became, I became enlightened and then started asking more. I knew the questions to ask. So I asked my mother, I said, well, did you learn German? She said, no. And I said, I said, did you hear German? She said, yes, of course. My grandmother never wanted to speak English, who lived a block away. My mother was born in Oldenburg and uh, lived there. Uh, lived there until she got married and, uh, in uh, 44. <clears throat> so um, my mother, who went to her grandmother's house all the time, grandmother would speak to her in German, but my mom said I would answer in English. So she had an understanding of German, but couldn't speak it. I thought that was very interesting. It's in, it's in that transition time. And I, I, I call that the Deutsche Dämmerung is the German twilight of that last German speaking generation, which of course it comes to, and you know, the, the cataclysm there is 1918, 1917, 1918. And then that's a change because my grandparents purposefully on both sides did not teach their children German, did not teach. But when my dad was dying, I heard him muttering things in German because he would hear them from his parents. So there was, you know, there's a thread there. And sometimes it's a very thin thread, but it's there. It's that last generation. But of course, German lasted longer in, du in Dubois County. It lasted a, a generation and a half because uh, uh, the brothers Flick, your parents' generation still knew German. 
and yeah, that yeah. people of your of our generation, there are very few of them that could still still speak. What would you call it? Uh, a Hausdeutsch. Hausdeutsch. You're unmuted now. Thank you. Of course, Daniel Nutzel explored that. We had that wonderful meeting down in Ferdinand. It was magnificent of those yeah. last German speakers. It was it was fantastic. That was so enlightening. Oh yes, yes it was. Oh, and by the way, and the we have the same Geschichte von von Ed Meyer und von Martha Basel erzählen können. Now, well, I told all those great stories of Father Basel and so forth from down in um, in good old Jasper and Ferdinand. I guess I'm one of the last non-native speakers of the, of the dialogue. Yeah. Giles, I am unmuted now. Uh, there you go. Hi. So yes. I can ask my question. <laughs> Conspicuous Please. by its absence in Oldenburg is any trace of the railroad. Where was was there a station, a re, any rail connection, or does that say something? Huh? Batesville. So it did not have rail service. So that it had not. an impact on the way things. Oh, were it would have it would have changed it completely. And uh, yeah. so it's there three miles three miles away. Is ba I call Batesville the the old the Oldenburg suburb because Oldenburg was first. Oh, okay. All right. So That's so when my grandfather, when he had his, uh, sorry, my great grandfather. All the goods for his store would come from Cincinnati on rail, and then he'd have to haul it by wagon to Oldenburg. To Olden. Yeah. Wow. What's the distance? Is it about three miles? Okay. My mom said that they would walk walk to the cinema. The Oldenburg didn't have a cinema, so they would walk oh. walk to. <laughs> didn't Oldenburg. see that either. <laughs> walk to Batesville for the cinema. Yeah. There's actually an old part. The original part of Batesville was called Huntersville, and it was well, in. Actually, yeah, it was huh. actually in Ray Township of uh, Correct. It's Franklin, on the County, Franklin County. That's right. And, and when they right. brought the railroad in, they went through that area. And so Huntersville was founded in the 1830s, about the same time that Oldenburg was. And then Batesville came in in the 1850s when the railroad came through and That's basically true. was on the other county side. Yeah. It'll be a uh, Ripley County side of Hunter right. Huntersville. And Huntersville was German Protestant. Yes. The village oh, north okay. of Oldenburg was Peppertown. That was German Lutheran. So you can yeah. go through Franklin yeah. County. I could I could name all of the Catholic towns and villages. And then there's a you know scattering of uh, uh, German Protestant communities. And sometimes it's just a crossroad. Oh, and by the way, Don Heinrich, Nick, near Oldenburg in the next township is St. Peter's. My other ancestors settled there. That was all Franconian. Franconian. But the priest was Fernanding. Fernanding, the Oldenburger, is the one that founded the parish because he found these Franconians settled in that area and knew that they needed a parish. So he and Father Rudolph then would go and, and serve these outlying. Uh, uh, satellite parishes, but that was Franconian. And then you have the Franconian Lutherans, the northern part of Franconia, not Franken, who heavy duty Lutherans in, in for example, Huntingburg. Huntingburg, so, yeah. Yeah. Huh. Very, very Lutheran. Uh, any mean? other, any comments from the, uh, any questions from the audience so we can take a chat down there if anybody has anything to to inquire otherwise um, I... there is a question in the chat okay um from sue wilds um she says some of my ancestors named zenf uh around oldenburg were from bavaria this area is too broad and i have hit a brick wall any idea what more specific area they might have come from I have traced some other ancestors from Dhamma. You know, Dhamma, she brings that up. That is the main source of German immigrants into Oldenburg. Um, and Dhamma now, is- We'll, we'll try to answer her question. Yeah. So uh, I, if I go to my great, great grandfather's stone, 
and you go to some of these other stones, sometimes it states where they're from, if they're the immigrants. So the memorial stones. And the other one are church records. And I learned this from Dr. DeVita, uh, James DeVita, who wrote the histories of, uh, he taught at Marion for decades and wrote the histories of Sacred Heart and St. Mary's. Uh, uh, he said uh, priests were to be fastidious in, in their record keeping. So, uh, so that if, he's, if they say you're a Catholic, well, you better be a Catholic because they're going to check it out. And so this is especially, you know, in this counter-reformation mode. So in, they, would, they would record, they could have recorded these immigrants where they were from in Germany, uh, down to the parish and the village. Uh, and Naturalization so, records also oftentimes list the uh, village and the, uh, maybe the ship that came over. But, but sometimes there's a, 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 a blank to fill in and just says well, it'll be the, the king of Bavaria. He, he, he then no longer has allegiance to that king or prince. It could be, but sometimes there's more information. Um, they, I know, and then you go to census, of course, then census has, paints a broad brush because you know after 1870, they just say Germany uh, after unification. Uh, but before that, when it's fragmented, you can then the, the other pragmatic or the problem, problematic one is Prussia, because all of the Rhineland is Prussia, and all of these Oldenburgers, well, not yet, but in that area, many of them are counted as Prussians. But Oldenburg retains some of its uh, its uh, independence for a while, <clears throat> and of course, Oldenburg. Then, of course, Napoleon then smashes the. Um, the bishopric or the, the bischofstum of, uh, of uh, Munster, and he splits it up. And so suddenly these Protestant princes have, have a Catholic minority, as, as was happening because Dama was the, was the Catholic town uh, and probably the, the center of, uh, of Catholic community in this area of Oldenburg. But they'd only been Oldenburgers for two generations. Before that, they were would not be Oldenburgers. That's the weirdness of of, of German nineteenth century politics. And yeah, it's a really it's a really border. The border just snakes around up in there. The way it separated the Kingdom of Hanover from the Grand Duchy of Oldenburg, and oh. and of course, the, both of those areas are now in the larger state of Lower Saxony or Niedersachsen. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so. Um, it's all been consolidated. Dr. Antonius Holtmann, uh, he was with me that summer. The, the friary was knocked down. He was from the University of Oldenburg. And so Antonius was, was um, he was researching these connections from Oldenburg to Oldenburg. So, uh, and then also, also uh, had the uh, Civil War letters from an Oldenburger in, down in Oldenburg, Indiana. Uh, Civil War letters. So that book was published uh, by uh, NCSA Literature, uh, the publishing arm of the Indiana German Heritage Society. So there's a, still a lot to research. You know, for a while I thought, well, we're Bavarian. Well, we're not Bavarian. We're Franconian, thanks to uh, <laughs> thanks to Napoleon. Thanks, Napoleon, um, of, of the shifting borders. But of course, Napoleon did everybody a favor by more or less modernizing the the the, poli the political the political realm of Germany by consolidating. Of course, that was done later on by the occupying powers of the British, the French, and the Americans uh, after 1945 into larger states. Uh, okay. I also well, I want to do a shout out to the Oldenburgers uh, who are in the audience, Jeff Paul. Jeff Paul supplied those wonderful pictures that I showed of the Oldenburg flag flying and uh, uh, the Freudenfest and uh, some other, uh, the Onion Dome in general. Those are beautiful pictures. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Karen Enneking, I know, is, has always been interested in, in the, the Oldenburg, Oldenburg connection going back to the 70s and is very, very aware of those things and also have some some Holker cousins uh, from Pennsylvania who, who are in the audience. And yeah, you know, so the people, and then of course my offspring are in the audience. So you honor me, you honor me with your presence online. Thank you. <laughs> um, if any other question, I have one question. The, where was the, the land office 
for that particular area. The, the US government had the land offices throughout there. For example, yeah. uh, up in, for Northern Indiana, it's over at the end of the Picor Road over in Ohio, Picor. And uh, where was it then, in Cincinnati itself? No, um, Brookville, which is the county seat of Franklin County, yes. was the land office okay. until 1825. In 1825, the land office moved to Indianapolis because the city, the state government finally moved to this pencil mark in the middle of the state. Brookville was a thriving town because of the federal land office. So, but that's 1825. So if you wanted to buy land in, Indi in Marion County, you went to Brookville until 1825. And that includes our friend, Richard Askren. His ancestors were pioneers in Warren Township. He went to Brookville to buy the land in Warren Township. After 1825, he went to Indianapolis, but by that time, see, Franklin County is a very old county. And some of that was open to, uh, because of the treaty in the 1790s, the easternmost portion. <clears throat> so, and of course, there's a, several treaty lines going through Franklin County. So um, if, the, if they didn't sell off before 1825 and the federal government still owned it, by that time, you had a lot of speculators who were buying large tracts of land. Ronald Baum and Plospol bought 200 acres and they bought it from a pioneer with a land grant, and a land grant, of course, he probably had service in the War of 1812 or the Revolution, but he was coming from, uh, from Tazewell, Virginia. William George was his name, and, uh, but they bought the land from him. He had built, he had done a, some improvement, and as a matter of fact, his log house, that was dismantled and later used to build the uh, cradle shop that my grandfather owned, which is half timber. So some of those timbers go back, <laughs> back to the 18, 1820s, if not 18 teens. So it was recycling. See, the Germans are very thrifty. They recycle it until they got stupid and tore down the fryer ring, you see. <laughs> uh, that was stupid. It was just heartbreaking. Was awful. Stupid. Um, so anyway, Giles, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Uh, we have a comment from Kent Robinson. Um, the Palatines to America, you know, the big genealogical organization, will have this national conference in Denver in June. And one of the speakers is our good friend Wolfgang Grams, oh. Yay. who is from Oldenburg and who's been here a number of times. And of course, he is quite knowledgeable about the uh, region. And there's an email uh, that you can use to get in uh, information, further information about the Palatines. So we'll look at the chat. Is there, uh, we're getting close to uh, closing time, I think, and uh, what's one of any other chat questions or Looks otherwise, like any other comments from our panel or speaker? There's a, Brian has a question here. Um, he oh. wanted to know, uh, has the Abbey been designated as a National Historic Landmark? What, which Abbey? I think he's Did talking he about... The convent, probably, yeah. St. Mon Saint Mon Saint Mon 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 I think he means the convent. The convent. The convent in Oldenburg. Franciscan. Uh, no, it's... Um, I did the National... I wrote the National Register nomination. So it, it's been on the National Register since 1983. Um, it's the whole town of Oldenburg, the whole town. Uh, but it doesn't have its own special designation. It, it does not. Mm -hmm. it, has the national, it has National Register status. As a district, yeah. As part of a district, that's right. Well, it, 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 and then additionally, um, Jeff Paul says, in honor of our German Heritage, we will be celebrating the Freudenfest this year on July 15th and 16th. Welcome all friends of Oldenburg. <laughs> and the Freudenfest is always a good time. It is, it is. And I'm getting ready. See, I'm wearing the Oldenburg flag right now on my tie. Oh. <laughs> it comes from the coat of arms of the Grand Duchy. And Jeff knows it because he flies that flag every day from his, uh, his shop in Oldenburg. Thanks, Jeff. 
and even Martin Luther will be there. <laughs> right there. You'll keep that in your pocket, I, I oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anything else? Uh, okay, what about uh, Twisterlauf? Twister, what? Twisterlauf. What? The Twister, Twister Run. Twisterlauf. Is that in Oldenburg? This is Brian. It's, it, it's in Freudenfest. It's a 5K run. It stops. It's at the top of the hill at the academy. And so uh, I haven't seen it in a few years. So I'm wondering, seeing how Freudenfest is coming back, hopefully the Twisterlauf will also. And Twister, I believe. Yep. Looks like it. Is the name of the high school or maybe is it the Oldenburg Academy? Twister. Oh, Jeff Paul answers yes, we are having it this year. So okay. All you runners can get out there and hike. There you go, Worth. There you go, Worth. You can you can <laughs> you can do the 5k in Oldenburg. Instead of twisters, that would be Schwestern. <laughs> okay, well, I want to thank Bill Salm, our speaker. Thank you, Bill. Excellent. And oh, our panel. Don and Ron Flick, and of course, our beloved friend, Dr. Don Heinrich Teufmann from Cincinnati. Thanks for, for joining us from all the way down in Cincinnati via Zoom. We appreciate that. And we'll see you next year. I've already got to in the docket as mentioned, as well as the Flicks. And of course, Bill will have more information. So next year we pick this up for art right at the, uh, at the place. Um, uh, we intend to have part of it at the uh, olden at the at the monastery or the convent, and then we'll be at the Sherman House if, if, if all goes as planned, and no nasty. Um, <laughs> hey, yeah. well, you say, you could, Giles, you could say the good Lord will, and the creek don't rise, and there ain't no COVID. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, or as we say in German, "Till Scott und wenn es kein COVID gibt." <laughs> okay, so thank you. I'll turn it back to Janet, who is our, our, uh, our webmaster here. And thank you all for coming to the program. And we'll see you at next events. I'll see you Thank Bill, you. Did you want to preview anything about the next, um, uh, the April meeting program, Trumpish? Oh gosh, um, yeah, yeah. I'm all talked out. Ron, I'll turn that over to you. Ron got that one. <laughs> oh, Ron's, 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 he may have already Ron. left. No, Ron's, Ron's still there. There. Um, He's muted. April. I'm, I'm drawing a blank, Janet. So uh, I'm sorry. Germans in Hunt, Huntville, Alabama. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Marcia, yes. Thank Marcia. you. Marcia uh, Glosso. So uh, she's going to talk about this German colony of, of intellectuals <coughs> who wind up in Huntsville, Alabama and transform Huntsville because suddenly they have culture. And uh, that will be that colony of Germans who were formerly in the V2 rocket team and then who become the foundation for NASA. So that's- Werner von Braun. Werner von Braun and my, my cousin, Uncle Rudy, Holker. Right. And that's a shout out to my Holker cousins. Right. And she says, hello, we'll see you at the Freudenfest with the family. Good. That's, oh, it's always a good time with my cousins. Okay, so I wish everybody Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen. Ron and Don, sure. thank you. Don, thanks, Don thanks, Don Heinrich. I wave the flag, Don Heinrich. <laughs> this Don. Okay. Don. Dankeschön. Dankeschön.